Our San Francisco Giants are roughly a third of the way through season number one of the series. And currently, we sit at a record of 26 and 28. Still very much alive in the National League wildcard picture. But we've been pretty inconsistent this month, and we've got some work to do going into the month of June. We're getting pretty close to the MLB draft. That'll be in the middle of July, which is only a couple episodes away. And we haven't talked about any prospects yet. That is until today. What we're going to be doing in this episode is rather than playing two games with the big league team, we're only going to go through one full game, and then we're going to talk about the pitchers in this year's draft class, and then the next episode we're going to format it very similarly, and we're going to go over the position players in the draft class, and then the following episode, which will be premiered this upcoming weekend, will be the 2024 MLB Draft. And for those of you who are newer to the channel, you may not know this, but we go all out for the draft episode so it should be a lot of fun. We'll get to these pitching prospects later in today's episode, but first we'll start with the current state of the team. And we've been on a little bit of a cold streak. We're three and seven over our last 10 games, and there are some notable holes within the team. We've got some guys who individually are playing really well. Jun Hu Lee has been phenomenal. Matt Chapman is looking like an excellent addition, but much of the rest of the lineup has been inconsistent. The rotation as well has been up and down. Obviously, we've gotten guys like Kyle Harrison and Keaton Wynn to really break out. And then the bullpen, as we know, has been, well, a train wreck, to put it nicely. I've been scouring the trade market since the start of May, and I think shaking up the roster and making a semi-big move wouldn't be the worst idea in the world. I feel like the team hasn't quite lived up to expectation, being that we're under 500. we We've been very inconsistent in the month of May. And I think there's one area of the roster, the middle infield, that could really use a tune-up. We've got Tyro Estrada at second base, who's been pretty disappointing this year, but I'm still optimistic about his future. It's really the shortstop position that needs help. Marco Luciano is nowhere near as ready as we thought he was coming into the year. Nick Ahmed and Casey Schmidt are currently platooning it short, and both of them are hitting under 200. If we can get some competent shortstop play, I think that can really raise the floor and the ceiling for our team who already is pretty league average. So I went through the trade market for some buy low options. Colton Wan was the first name who popped up. He's hitting 400 in AAA this year, but he also tore his calf, so he's likely not available. Jorge Mateo with the Orioles is having a great season, but they have Jackson Holiday ready in the minor leagues, and Mateo is blocking him from playing time. I think because of that, Mateo could be pretty expendable, but I don't really want to trade for him when his value is at its highest. J.P. Crawford in Seattle would be a pretty interesting one because he's a full-time starter for a contender, but he hasn't been all that good this year. I think he could be a solid buy-low option for a Mariners team who has other infielders playing better. Santiago Espinal in Toronto, I think, could work. One of the most random all-stars in recent memory. Espinal is more of a platoon guy, and that's where his role would be once Marco Luciano is fully healthy. But the idea with Espinal is that the Blue Jays have a reliever who's on the trade block, who I think I would really want. So it would kind of be a two for one. I think of the options I said, J.P. Crawford and Santiago Espinal probably would be the best choices in my opinion. And I think the value between Crawford and then Espinal and the relief pitcher, Genesis Cabrera, would be pretty similar. I think of these two options, I would prefer to make a deal with Seattle for J.P. Crawford because he gives us more consistency as an everyday shortstop and sure, he hasn't played all that well this year, but I think as a buy-low candidate, he'll hopefully do better with a change of scenery. Being that Seattle is one of the better teams in the American League, I think they're going to look to add another bat here rather than a couple of prospects. They obviously don't really need infield help, being that they're super deep there as is with Josh Rojas, Dylan Moore, Luis Urias, and Jorge Polanco, but I think they could use another outfielder. Julio Rodriguez is great at center. J.D. Martinez is a phenomenal D.H., but they could use another corner outfielder to join Luke Raley and Mitch Hanninger. Because of that, I think a guy like Michael Conforto would make a lot of sense for them. He gives them another lefty bat who had a great start to the year but has cooled off. He is making $18 million this year, but he's also an expiring contract. This deal gives Seattle more long-term financial flexibility. We're also going to be giving up Blaine Enloe, a 25-year-old right-handed starting pitching prospect. He's a fringe top 15 prospect in the organization, so he's a pretty solid piece along with Conforto, but I think it's worth it. Sure, J.P. Crawford's on a pretty big contract and hasn't played all that well this year, but I think as a buy low option, hopefully he'll improve with the trade. We're going to make another roster move here, calling up Elliot Ramos. He's cold right now, but he's played pretty well in AAA, whereas Luis Matos 
has not performed well this year in the big leagues, and he'll be sent down. So the roster looks a little bit different with the addition of J.P. Crawford playing shortstop. And ideally, once Marco Luciano is ready, whether that's this year or later on, Crawford's a guy who can play pretty much everywhere in the infield. So this is somebody who's going to be a starter for us for at least the next two and a half seasons, if all goes well. We're going to player lock his debut as a San Francisco Giant here at home, playing short against the team who originally drafted him, the Philadelphia Phillies. Once upon a time, Crawford was a top prospect in this organization. Things didn't really work out. He was traded to Seattle where he had some good seasons. Obviously, this year he's fallen off a little bit. But again, the hope is that he'll do better with the trade. Keaton Wynn, who has been one of the biggest surprises this year for the Giants, will get the start. He'll go up against Taiwan Walker for the Phillies. So we'll go bottom two. Already the Phillies lead 4-0. Not a great start here, but hopefully J.P. Crawford can look to change that with a runner aboard and nobody out. 1-0 pitch, lines this one sharply into left, but it will be caught for the first out of the inning. JP's second at bat would come later in the fourth inning. The Giants would add a pair, making it 4-2. Crawford's ahead of the count, 2-0. As he lifts a splitter into right center, I don't think that one has enough carry, and it is going to be caught for the second out of the inning. So far, a quiet start for Crawford in his Giants debut. He's 0-2. Hopefully, the bottom of the sixth inning can go a little bit better as he takes the first pitch, grounds it over to first, and it'll be fielded cleanly by Bryce Harper, who tags the bag. JP will likely get one more at bat here. Bottom nine, Phillies lead 5-2 as the lefty Jose Alvarado is in for the save. And Crawford swings at the 0-2 pitch, hits it well into center, but it will be caught. Crawford had some good swings. He hit the ball pretty hard, but ultimately goes 0-4 in his San Francisco Giants debut. San Fran would get another run in this game, but ultimately they lose to the Phillies by the final score of 5-3. Keaton Wynn had probably one of his worst starts of the year, taking his first loss of the entire season, while Taiwan Walker takes the win. We fall to 26-29, and, and now we are going to continue to do some simulating into the month of June as we wrap up the series against Philadelphia. And then we've got a three-game set at home against the New York Yankees, led by former giant Arson Judge. So Tristan Beck, a relief pitcher who's been out for the entire year, he is healthy. And this is actually an addition I'm really excited about. Beck threw nearly 100 innings last year, and he pitched quite well. And with our bullpen needing all the help it can get, he's going to start the year with the big league club, while the rookie Eric Miller will go down to the minors. Tristan Beck has B potential and will replace Miller as the long reliever. Let's hop into this last game here against the Phillies. We trail 4-3. to three. We've got two guys on and two away for pinch hitter Wilmer Flores, who hasn't been all that good this year. He's barely hitting above 200, but I trust him more than any of the other options. 0-1 pitch, and Flores rips it into center. That'll go for a hit. Runner holds up at third, and that proves to be a good decision. He would have been out by a mile. So now the bases are loaded. A base hit probably drives in two. That would presumably end the game. That'll bring us back to the top of the order. It's Tyro Estrada who hits it well into right. Will it drop? It does not. And the Phillies take this one by the final score of 4-3. to three. The Phillies end up winning this series, and we would also only take 1-3 of three against the Yankees. We haven't gotten swept in a while, but we also haven't won a series in a while. I want to look at the game that we won against the Phillies. We got an eight-inning shutout from Blake Snell. We've got no consistency from Snell this year. He's had some really good starts like that one, but also some really bad ones. So that brings us into this three-game series here against the Arizona Diamondbacks. I wanted to play against them being that, for one thing, they're a division rival, but they also just won the National League, and they've gotten off to a pretty good start this year, currently in second place in the division. And we get to pitch with Logan Webb, the ace of the staff, which I think should be pretty fun. I will point out the in-game audio for this game did not record. I don't know why. I fixed the problem. It won't be an issue in the future. But I had to add some manual crowd noise, and I added some manual bat-to-ball hits. So it might sound a little off, but just go with it. I don't think it's going to prove to be that big of a deal. Anyway, Ryan Nelson is getting the start here for Arizona. The young righty has been up and down this year. He'll face off against Jung-Hoo Lee with one away, and he skies this one into the opposite field. It's got some carry that'll drop, and it'll bounce over the fence for a ground rule double. Jung-Hoo Lee hits to the opposite field so well. He's done it time and time again throughout the early going of the season as he's now hitting 335 on the year after ripping the double. 
That's going to be a wild pitch with Lee at third. He's going to look to score, and he is safe. The Giants get in a run off of a wild pitch by Ryan Nelson. An unconventional way to do it, but hey, that'll work. Heads up base running from Lee. Let's go to the bottom of the first where we get a look at Logan Webb, who has had a very Logan Webb-esque season. He's throwing a lot of innings. He's not allowing a lot of walks or hits. He's not throwing a lot of strikeouts, and he's getting the job done. Christian Walker is the leadoff hitter. Don't ask me why. But he rips this one into left field, and that will go for a ground rule double of his own. Elliot Ramos getting the start in left today as Mikey Yastrzemski and Austin Slater are both a little bit dinged up getting the day off. Jordan Lawler, single into right, and Arizona will immediately get the run back as we are tied at one. And the former top prospect, Jordan Lawler, knots this one up. Cattell Marte up for the Diamondbacks, and he goes down on the fastball. Nice pitch by Webb, fooling him on the outside, and we go into the second. Matt Chapman goes down looking on the circle change. Other than Lee, Matt Chapman has been by far the most consistent player on the offense this year as J.P. Crawford ignites this one into right center. At the track, at the wall, it is long gone. Fifth home run of the year for Crawford and his first as a Giant. A big swing for J.P. Crawford as he looks to get things going with his new team. First home run here with the squad. And the Giants are back ahead 2-1. to one. No shortage of offense here in the early going. Bottom two. Lourdes Gurriel Jr. Rips this one down the line and fair into left field. That'll go for a leadoff hit. Ramos gets to it quickly. And so the Diamondbacks get a runner aboard. Already, Logan Webb has allowed three hits. Make it four if it stays fair. And this one from Suarez is barely foul. The Giants catch a major break as Suarez strikes down on the very next pitch, going down on the slider. Two away now for the catcher, Ronaldo Hernandez, who gets that one by Wilmer Flores for a single into right. So the Diamondbacks now have two on, two away for the top of the order. The first baseman, Christian Walker, who grounds it over to second. Estrada fields it cleanly. Third to first is in time. And Logan Webb, despite kind of a shaky start for his standards, gets out of the jam as we move into the third. One away here for John Hu Lee, who had an opposite field double in his last at bat, and he's looking for another. This one's got carry, and that one will go off the wall. You guessed it, an opposite field double for John Hu Lee, who continues his exceptional season. He leads the all-star vote in the National League at center field, and he's amongst the leaders for the batting title. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like he'll score here. Lamont Wade tops it, and it will be caught in center by Alec Thomas. 2-1 to one still as we go into the bottom of the third, two away for Corbin Carroll, and he will draw a walk. Not the guy you want to let on base because he's got some wheels. The former giant, Jock Peters, hits up, and he lines this one sharply in the left. Ramos is there to make the play. And Logan Webb seems to be doing better after his slow start. And you can say the same for Ryan Nelson, who's starting to pitch pretty well. Wilmer Flores rips this one into center, though. That one will go for likely extra bases. That's Flores' second hit of the day as he makes it into second with a double. Quick start for Flores, looking to pick things up with his disappointing season. As Blake Sabal, the catcher who's had a nice year, grounds it over to short. Jordan Lawler makes the play. Another scoreless inning for Ryan Nelson as we move into the bottom of the fourth. Lourdes Gurriel Jr. leads it off for the Diamondbacks, and he hits this ball well into center. No doubt about it. Jung Hu Lee can only watch it fly. Solo home run for Lourdes Gurriel Jr., his ninth of the year, and this game is tied at two. Big response for the Diamondbacks, and we're knotted up. A Eugenio Suarez, the very next batter, Will hit this one well into right. Going to be a tough play for Soler, and he will not make the grab as it bounces over the fence into the bullpen for a ground rule double. Another base runner here with nobody out for Thomas, who grounds it to short. Crawford blocks it. Throw to first is not in time. An infield single for Thomas. The Diamondbacks is a team already of seven hits today. So Logan Webb's got to pick it up as he strikes out Ronaldo Hernandez on the slider. And now Christian Walker with 108 pits it on the ground. This could be two, four, six, three, inning ending double play. All things considered, that inning could have gone a lot worse. Yes, the Diamondbacks tie it up, but I feel like that could have been a lot more disastrous as we move into the fifth. 
Elliot Ramos goes down looking on the full count fastball. He thought that pitch was outside. Bottom five. Jordan Lawler up the middle. Another hit for Arizona as Lawler leads off the inning with a single. And again, not the guy you want to let on base because he's got some wheels. And unfortunately on that play, as Estrada was diving for the ball, it looks like he got a little dinged up. Shouldn't be anything long-term to worry about, but he'll be taken out of the game and replaced by Casey Schmidt. That'll bring up Cattell Marte, who swings and misses at the 1-1 slider. It's a wild pitch, and so Lawler's able to make it to second. So now one of the fastest players in the league is in scoring position with nobody out. As Cattell Marte goes down on the circle change, Corbin Carroll strikes down on the sinker. Can Logan Webb get one more here with Peterson to get out of the jam? It looks like he will. It's a grounder to second. Schmidt makes the play. And again, didn't start off pretty, but Logan Webb gets through the inning. His day likely done as we move into the sixth. The pitching changes well for Arizona. They'll bring in Ryan Thompson. The righty's had a great year out of the pen with an ERA barely above two and around 40 innings of work. He'll go up against Lamont Wade, who draws a walk on the outside slider. Thompson has a pretty funky pitching motion, as you can see, but it works. Crawford lines out to left. That'll wrap up the top of the sixth. San Francisco's offense looked really good early, and they've done nothing since the home run by Crawford back in the second. Tristan Beck comes in for the Giants. He's allowed one run in four innings so far, as he will start with Lourdes Gurriel Jr., who lost this ball into left center. That one is high and deep, and it is out of here. Curiel with his second home run of the game, his 10th of the year, and the Diamondbacks for the first time today had the lead as it's now 3-2. to two. I'm curious to see if the Sun is going to make an impact here on these batters. It clearly does here on a Eugenio Suarez because he thought that pitch was a walk, but it went right down the middle. Alec Thomas hits it well into left. If it's fair, it's gone. It's going to be close. And again, just barely foul by around 10 feet. So once again, the Giants dodge a bullet, but Thomas will still reach base as he ropes this one down the left field line. He should make it over to second with a double, and the Diamondbacks with a one-out extra base hit. Thomas is not as fast as Lawler and Carroll, but he's also got some wheels. Ronaldo Hernandez checks swings on the changeup. Umpire says he went around. Two away here for Walker. He goes down on the fastball, and so that'll wrap up the inning. Beck does allow a run with the homer by Gurriel as we go into the seventh. The first time All-Star from a year ago, Joe Mantiply is in for the Diamondbacks. Being that he's a lefty, the Giants are going to bring in Tom Murphy off the bench. He hits this ball well into left. At the track, at the wall, it's gone! Solo home run for Tom Murphy as a pinch hitter. And this game is knotted up at three, his second of the year. The regular catcher, Blake Sable, does not hit lefties well. But Tom Murphy does. And this one... Is not it up at three apiece. Casey Schmidt hits lefties pretty well, all things considered. Obviously coming in off the bench as he goes down on the 12-6. What a pitch by Matt Supply. But the Giants tie it with the homer by Murphy, and we go bottom seven. Taylor Rogers is in for San Francisco. The lefty's been okay this year, 4.05 ERA. As Cattell Marte sends this ball a long way. In the left center, and the Diamondbacks get their lead right back. Solo home run for Marte, and it's now 4-3 to three in favor of Arizona. That's his 10th of the year. Corbin Carroll goes down looking on the sinker, and that would be it for Rodgers as we move into the 8th. Miguel Castro is in for the Diamondbacks. He's only allowed two runs this year in a little over 20 innings. As he'll face off against jun Hu Lee, looking for his third hit of the game, and he'll get it. Single into center. Lee's average moves up to about 340 now. His season continues to get better and better. We're not even looking at Rookie of the Year at this point. Could he make an MVP push? I know that sounds crazy, but I think it's possible. There's Lamont Wade. Goes down on the circle change. Two away from Matt Chapman. Grounded a short. And that gets by Lawler for a base hit. Jordan Lawler getting the start today with the regular shortstop. Geraldo Perdomo getting the day off. So Castro's going to be taken out of the game after allowing a couple of hits. He'll be replaced by Kevin Ginkle. 5.52 ERA on the year for him. And what a big at-bat this is for the new giant, J.P. Crawford. Two on, two away. I feel like this is one of the biggest at-bats of our season. This play could really give us some momentum. Crawford's ahead, two and one, and he gets the perfect pitch to hit. And he tops it. It was a fastball right down the middle. 
He timed it well, but unfortunately it does not hit the sweet spot of the bat as it's caught by Thomas, and the Diamondbacks hold on to their lead. Out with Taylor Rogers, in with Tyler Rogers. The other twin has not gotten off to a great start this year, but he has played better over the last month or so. With one away, a Eugenio Suarez sends this one into left center. That one is out of here, and the Diamondbacks add to their lead. It's 5-3. Suarez, one of the better power hitters in baseball with his sixth of the year, as that ball goes nearly 440 feet for the D-backs. Alec Thomas now up the middle, base hit, as it gets by the glove of Schmidt. And already another not-so-good game from Tyler Rogers. And because of that, he's going to get yanked. He'll be replaced by the lefty Amir Garrett, who I think has been the Giants' most consistent reliever this year. 2.25 ERA as Hernandez hits it into right. Will that stay fair? No, it's just foul again. That's the third time today Arizona's got boned by a ball going fair or foul. He'll draw a walk instead. Christian Walker now. He will draw a walk as well, living up to his name. And the bases are loaded. Rough start for Garrett as he walks the first two batters. Jordan Lawler singles into right. Run scores and it's 6-3 as Garrett has single-handedly loaded the bases. Three batters he faces. They all get on. So he's going to be yanked. And the Giants are going to go to their third pitcher of the inning. It's Luke Jackson into the game. So that'll bring up Ketel Marte as this one goes barely foul. And again, the Diamondbacks get unlucky. It won't matter, though. Marte bloops it into right. It somehow goes for a hit. Two runs will score, and it's now 8-3 to three as things go from bad to worse for the Giants. Runners on the corners with still one away for Corbin Carroll. He pops this one into left center. jung Hu Lee chases after it. He'll make the play, but that should be more than enough room for Jordan Lawler to score. And it's now 9-3. to three. The Diamondbacks have put up a five spot here in the eighth. Gurriel was the first batter out this inning, and he will also be the last batter out with a grounder to Chapman. Big inning for the Diamondbacks, despite getting unlucky on numerous occasions today. They lead 9-3, looking to close it out here against Elliot Ramos, who swings and misses at the slider, and that'll do it. Arizona takes this one 9-3, despite having three home runs barely go foul, and another ball barely go foul as well that would have resulted in runs. I guess this is Arizona's ball-don't-lie moment as they're still able to win big. Our offense started the game off well. We were looking good in the first inning. We had the homer by Crawford in the second, and then we just did nothing after that. Wilmer Flores and Jun Hu Lee had five of our team's eight hits today. Logan Webb did not have his best start, but I think the story here is the bullpen, who had another really, really bad performance. 16 hits today for the Diamondbacks, and it really should have been more. They go deep four times. Solid start from Ryan Nelson, and the bullpen was pretty good as well. Tyro Estrada with a muscle strain. Again, nothing serious, but he is now dinged up with Yastrzemski and Slater. That's three guys who are currently hurt for us, likely through this series against Arizona. We do get some good injury news as Alex Cobb is healthy after missing the first portion of the year coming off of back surgery in the offseason. Alex Cobb is an interesting one because he's 36 years old, but he's a really good player. He's coming off an all-star appearance last year. And I think that he'll be able to slide into the rotation for the rest of the year after we get a couple starts under his wing in double-A and triple-A. Cobb is a good player. He's finished with at least 2.64 over the last three years. And again, a first-time All-Star last year. Now, the question is, who would we take out of the rotation? It's obviously not going to be any of the big guys. Jordan Hicks has had a disappointing season, but he's getting paid a lot of money. It's not going to be Kyle Harrison. And Keaton Wynn's done really well. So I don't know who we would take out. Let's do some simulating as we're going to get through the series against the Diamondbacks and the Rangers, and then we return home to face off against the Astros and the Angels. So in our very next game, we're tied at five here in the 10th inning with two runners aboard for Austin Slater, who's injured. I don't know why they're playing him, but they are. So Slater's got a big opportunity to do some damage as it's knocked down by Alec Thomas at first, and he'll only get the one out at second. Do not ask me why the Diamondbacks are playing Alec Thomas at first. I know that's one of his secondary positions, but with his range, I don't know why they have Randall Gritchick in center instead of him. Runners on the corners now for Lamont Wade, who pops it up, slams the bat in frustration. The Giants had a big opportunity to do some damage, and unfortunately, they're unable to, but we still get the win. 7-5 with an RBI single by Jorge Soler in the 11th, followed by an RBI double from Elliott Ramos. 
During the simulation, I would get a trade here from the Nationals, who have offered us a few trades this year for some of their outfield prospects. And that's going to be the case again here with Jeremy De La Rosa for Hunter Bishop. Bishop's having a great year, so I don't want to do this deal. But again, the Nationals clearly want to get rid of these prospects. They really like Dylan Cruz and James Wood. And I think they're pretty content on Stone Garrett being their third starting outfielder. So that means all these B potential guys, Victor Robles, Elijah Green, Robert Hassel, and Jeremy De La Rosa are all expendable to them, which makes me think that theoretically we could swindle a deal for one of these guys down the line. The Nationals aren't exactly a good team looking for win now pieces, but it's something to keep an eye on. In Alex Cobb's first rehab start, he hurts his finger. Hopefully not a sign of things to come, but what I do hope is a sign of things to come is this performance from John Hu Lee against the reigning champion Texas Rangers. He's a home run shy of the cycle here in the ninth inning as the legend of John Hu Lee continues to grow. So Lee's going to face off against Carson Coleman, and he hits this one well into center. That's not getting enough carry to get out, as it will be caught. But still a great performance here from Lee as the Giants win by the final score of 7-3. to three. No score change after that play from Lee. And I did some digging after this game and found some interesting stuff. This game was the Major League debut of Jack Leiter, the former second overall pick. And we absolutely rocked him. It wasn't just John Hu Lee. It was everybody who hit the ball well. Let's now hop into the series here against the Astros. Top of the ninth inning. Two outs. Two on for Kyle Tucker. And that one gets over the glove of Crawford for a hit in the left center. Run scores. And the Astros lead it 7-6. Who would have guessed? The bullpen blows another one. The Astros have 17 hits as a team. Make it 18. Alex Bregman into the right field corner. That'll make it 8-6 as Bregman is safe with a double. Luke Jackson allows two late runs here in the ninth inning. And that ultimately ends up being the difference as the Astros take it 8-6. Unfortunately, we went 2-6 through the first eight games we simulated, including getting swept by the Astros. But on the bright side, we then swept the Los Angeles Angels, who have been one of the worst teams in the league. But we'll take all the wins we can get, as we now set a record of 34 and 38. Before we wrap up today's episode, though, let's take a look at this year's draft class. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, we're going to look at some of the top pitching prospects this year. In the MLB draft, I don't like to draft for need. I only like to focus on value. So that's what we're going to do throughout this year's draft, whether that's drafting pitching heavy or position players heavy. And I will point out, I have a lot more success with drafting pitchers in this game. So we are going to plan accordingly. Overall, this is a really strong class pitching wise. Ton of really good players here at the top of the class and in terms of down the board. So let's look at some of the guys projected in the top 10 who we're not gonna get our hands on. We're not gonna look at highlights for these guys because I wanna go over them pretty quickly. Carlos Pena is the first one, a 19 year old righty. Good walks per nine, good hits per nine. Looks like a pretty solid player. Kerry Walls, a 19-year-old from Canada. Great hits and walks per nine. I think he could be in contention to go number one overall to the Cleveland Guardians who develop pitchers better than just about anybody. And then there's Tom Buckley, another Canadian. Great strikeouts per nine, pretty good walks per nine. He throws lefty, and our scouts seem to think he's the best prospect in the draft. But again, I don't think there's any reasonable shot he falls to our first rounder at 13th overall. What about some guys who could fall? And I think for these next three, it's a little bit unlikely, but it's possible. We'll start with DJ Marquez, an 18-year-old righty from Pennsylvania. We got to look at him in the Perfect Game All-American Showcase. He ended up throwing a couple innings, and we got to see his nasty swing and miss stuff on display. He's going to have a super high strikeout rate, I think. That's his best attribute. His hits per nine and walks per nine are two things that I would really look to develop, but he throws super hard, and he strikes guys out at a high rate. Dominican righty Craig Hernandez is another name to watch out for. At just 18 years old, his game isn't entirely dissimilar. He's not necessarily my type of pitcher because, again, hits per nine and walks per nine are the two most important stats, in my opinion, for pitchers, and he seems to be kind of weak there. But if he were to fall to 13, that would possibly be really good value, and I think he's got a really high ceiling. Mason Lamb, the 21-year-old righty out of the University of Kentucky, is another option as well. I think he's really refined. He's a workhorse who consistently goes seven to eight innings per start, high strikeout rate, and the rest of his numbers look really good as well. He's probably going to be in the 70s overall-wise right off the bat. So he's a guy who you know what you're going to get, but he's got a high ceiling as well. What about some guys who probably will fall to our top pick? 
And that starts with 18-year-old Dominican righty Pedro Ortega. I think he's actually pretty polished for an 18-year-old. And I also think the ceiling with him is really high. This is somebody who's going to be very much in play with the 13th pick in the draft. Ortega's best qualities are his walks per nine and his home runs per nine. He keeps the ball in the park. He's steady. He's consistent. And he looks like a 23-year-old out there oftentimes, even though he's only 18. Ken Shibuya, the Japanese lefty, also looks like he's 23 years old out there. And that's because, well, he's literally 23. Shibuya has made his way over to the States playing for Oregon State. He's a little bit undersized, but I think he's a really good player. And again, high floor, but he's also got a really high ceiling as well. Our scouts don't seem to like him that much, but I think he'd be a fantastic pick at 13. Look at the walks per nine. That's better than any pitcher in this draft. His control and consistency is a big plus for his game. I think he could be in our rotation as soon as next season, and I think he's got ace potential. What about some gems down the board? We'll start with Fred Burke, who's projected as a late first rounder, but our scouts seem to think he's quite a bit better than that, viewing him as a possible top 10 player in this draft. If a lot of the guys we want don't make it to pick 13, Fred Burke's probably going to be there, and he could be a really good backup option. Some other names to watch out for include Ryan Delorier, Johnny Mabry, Mark Hopp, Esteban Diafuerte, but I think Milt Wilkerson could be a really good player for us. I love his skill set. Hits per nine, walks per nine, checks off both of those boxes. The problem is I don't really think we're in range to get him because the first round might be too early, but he's probably not going to fall to us in the second round. So if we want him, we're probably going to have to reach for him with that 13th pick. But with his talent, it might just be worth it. Another gem who I want to watch out for is Johnny Church. This 22-year-old Cuban righty is another high-floor guy who I think is going to be in your rotation within a couple years. And I think the ceiling is decently high. Herschel Delahanty also could be in play for the Giants' second rounder. An 18-year-old Dominican righty. I think he's got a pretty solid skill set and could end up being a pretty good pick at 50th overall. Freddie Murphy and Brad McKinnon, though, I think are two really big sleepers. Murphy is a lefty, 6'4", taking the junior college route out of Mississippi. And then Brad McKinnon might be one of the most underrated players in the draft. A 18-year-old righty from Wisconsin. McKinnon is someone who our scouts believe is a top 10 player in this entire draft. If he falls to the Giants pick in the second round, he would be a great selection, and he might even be in play in the first round. Here are some other guys to watch out for and some possible late-round gems in the third round and beyond include Dave Ventura, J.J. Green. There's also Scott Rios as well, a lefty at 18 years old. Some of these guys down the board here have really high ceilings and could be names to watch. We haven't really scouted many of the relievers because, well, I don't really want to draft relievers, but I wouldn't mind picking somebody who's a little bit older, who's already kind of scouted highly because of their age. Eddie Brito's a guy I like. He's got really good stamina and could become a starter. And Steve Liriano is in the same boat. Even if these guys aren't starters, they could become lawn relievers. Fernando Molina, another guy who fits this criteria. And then two guys who aren't projected to get drafted really at all for the most part, who I think are names to watch, would be David Ling and Johnny Guzman. Both have high stamina ratings, both have pretty high ceilings, but both guys are a little bit older as well. In the next episode, we're going to talk about the position players in this class. I'm excited to dive a little bit deeper into those guys. And then, of course, the following episode will be the MLB Draft. That's going to wrap up the episode. I hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know what you thought of some of these prospects down below in the comments. And also let me know what you thought of our very first trade, acquiring J.P. Crawford from the Seattle Mariners. I hope everybody enjoyed. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Peace out.